Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I was browsing around AliExpress and I saw something unusual. Uh, some places are selling it as a toy, other places are selling it as a self-defense weapon. So I thought I'd buy one and just check it out, do some legal analysis and share that with you guys. That is this thing. So this piece here is just a cover, it comes off. And inside there are five, although they also make a three slot model, but five slots, each of which is loaded with a spring. Into that you would put a dart and it comes with this little plastic cover, but that plastic cover comes off and then you've just got a metal spike. They come sort of from the factory about as sharp as a ballpoint pen. Um, I can sort of do this without injury, but I could imagine that you could sharpen them up uh, without too much trouble. So those get pushed into the slots here and I'm not going to properly load it all the way just because this is my house I'm not going to load it anywhere where I don't want it to accidentally go off but once it's in it clicks into place this piece here slides and serves as a rudimentary safety and once sort of it's in place you can push the buttons to discharge the corresponding projectile and they fly out they say that it goes 20 or 30 feet. I found that after about 10 feet, they start to tumble and so they no longer will reliably land point first, but 10 feet, still 10 feet. So there's a number of questions that come up and I'll start with sort of the legal questions here. Uh, first, one of the things that we're going to want to know is how is this classified in terms of Canadian law? Because how it's classified will determine what you can do with it. So the first thing I want to look at here is, is this a firearm? And firearm means a barreled weapon from which any shot, bullet, or other projectile can be discharged. And these darts are a projectile. They do fly out and they land somewhere, so that's a projectile. Can be discharged and it is capable of causing serious bodily injury or death to a person and includes any frame or receiver of such a barreled weapon and anything that can be adapted for use as a firearm. So the test for whether or not something is capable of causing serious bodily injury or death that's generally been accepted by the courts is can it puncture an eyeball? Now, obviously we're not going to be testing this on human eyes because uh, notwithstanding the fact that human eyes are the, the standard because it's to a person, but we don't have any human volunteers and there'd be serious ethical issues with doing such an experiment. However, pig eyes are accepted as sort of the, the standard replacement. There is a sort of a study that the courts have referred to in the past, and this was a study where they used pig eyes. And the way they do that is those pig eyes were then placed into a foam sort of something to simulate the orbit of the eye. And they use that as a, as a test site. I have done something to try to replicate that. And so I did some testing with this thing. Let's see how it functions in terms of looking at this. And again, these are pig eyes and they're, you know, the product of the pork industry. So, you know, such is life, but uh, just testing this out. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a warning. If you're a little squeamish, this might be a little gross, uh, but this is the legal test. This is how the courts determine if something is capable of causing serious bodily injury or death. There is no other real test. Uh, sometimes you'll see, they'll say, oh, well, you know, once it goes above this certain feet per second, but that of course depends on the projectile. And we have two different possibilities for what our projectile looks like. Those speeds are also arrived at by using the pig eye test. So basically they say we shot a bunch of pig eyes and these are the speeds at which they were capable of puncturing a pig eye. So therefore these are, you know, we now know this, but the pig eye thing is the test. So I apologize in advance if you're a little squeamish and this is maybe not, uh, not your favorite thing to watch, but uh, all right, on we go. Throw on a, uh, a gas mask, which is thankfully impact rated. It also gives me a nice field of vision. Hey folks, safety first. All right, so let's get this sort of secured up again here. And let's just see how this works in practice. All right, so we got our foam test subject here. 
and sliding the safety cover off. I feel like he's had better days. That looks like some damage there. And that's even with the little plastic uh, safety cover there. So, all right. Now, that raises some questions because, of course, the test for whether or not this is a firearm or what it is requires serious bodily injury or death. And we are not made of foam. So as much as it is, you know, useful to test out on the foam head, we're going to set that aside. Instead, we're going to bring out my lovely assistant here. And now the pig eyeballs should properly be set into some sort of, you know, structure so that they're not uh, just floating loose. So we're just going to go ahead and do that. We're going to plop that eyeball right in here so that it's got a little bit more of a structure to it. Yeah, that is creepy as hell. All right, so sort of turning that here. We're going to test once again and see, can this thing destroy an eyeball? I have a suspicion that the answer is yes, but uh, we're going to find out. Just masking up again, so you can probably hear that in my voice. All right, so we've got this here. I'm going to try this first with the regular spike. All right, so we've got that lined up. We're going to just fire from a very short distance here. is surprising. Let's have a look. So it's got some damage, but it did not... No, maybe. Yep, there's some leakage, but it did not puncture the way I thought it might. So let's have another... have another go. Just gonna line up a little. Again, good solid scratch, but it's not punctured. Trying with the shield on. Getting that eyeball back in. This thing is a little sticky. Oh! Oddly enough, it punctured better with the thing on than it did when it was off. I suspect that might have been because it's like the third or fourth try here. So we're just going to set this aside. Lovely, huh? How are we doing now? There we go. Look at this fine gentleman. Get this out of the way. All right, so.
So just having a look at what that impact did, you can see it's leaking fluid here. That is definitely a puncture. Alright, so what we've determined this thing is certainly capable, it's not great, but it's certainly capable of puncturing a pig eyeball when fired at close distances. I gotta say, that is the creepiest thing I have seen in a long time. I may have to save this for uh, Halloween use. Yeah, that is really creepy. All right, so we're just gonna carefully extract that. You can see there is a substantial leaking hole there. I did a bunch of additional tests with a bunch of additional eyes, but I think this is really enough to show what's going on. There's a few things I noticed. The first is that the darts actually had a fairly difficult time puncturing the cornea at the sort of center of the eye. They had a much easier time puncturing the sclera, where it's weaker around the edge of the eye, including in some cases the dart would hit the cornea, sort of skitter off, and then gouge in at the sclera. Now, that isn't to say that it never punctured the cornea. Some of the darts did, including some of the darts on a first firing. So I can't say that the cornea is sort of invulnerable to these darts or that the darts can't penetrate the cornea. They're just much less likely to. The other thing is that many of the injuries seen are ones that I, you know, I'm not an ophthalmologist, I'm not an expert here, but I would still consider them to be fairly catastrophic. Uh, previous research has basically said uh, once you've got a puncture that is releasing vitreous humor, which is the liquid that you saw coming out in these videos, that that's enough to consider it sort of a catastrophic destruction and enough to count as serious bodily injury. I think a judge would have a very difficult time seeing a dart sort of puncture into an eye and that sort of leakage and not say, yeah, that's serious bodily injury. So my conclusion then is that this thing is able to cause serious bodily injury or death. And I don't know about death. I think death might be hard, but certainly serious bodily injury. So what does that mean? It means in Canadian law, this thing is a firearm. That takes us to the next question, because just because it's a firearm doesn't mean it's a full firearm that you need a license for. What uh, is likely here is that this is going to be a firearm that is in the sort of 84 sub 3 category, which is the same category as airsoft guns, as many BB guns, many pellet guns. Not all, of course, because some of them fire faster. And we'll just look here at the uh, the criteria. I know I've gone over this in pri prior videos, but we'll just go over it again here. And so that is for the purposes of some of the sections of the criminal code uh, and the provisions of the Firearms Act, the following weapons are deemed not to be firearms. And we don't care about antique firearms or things designed for signaling. The bit we care about here is any other barreled weapon where it is proved that the weapon is not designed or adapted to discharge one, a shot bullet or other projectile at a muzzle velocity exceeding 152.4 meters per second, or at a muzzle energy exceeding 5.7 joules, or one that uh, reaches a velocity. That's not going to be a concern with this. The, the second portion of one that attains a velocity is really if you're dealing with things like rockets, where they will accelerate in flight. These will decelerate. So I'm going to run this through a chronograph. We're going to see, and my chronograph is actually in meters per second. So we're going to see if it ever ticks over 152.4. If it does, then this is a full firearm and would need a firearms license to have. If not, then it's, uh, then it's not. Then it would be an 84 sub 3 firearm and much, much easier to have uh, sort of legally. All right, let's have a look. The darts are clocking in at just under 20 meters per second. 
that's good because if they were going over 152.4 meters per second, then this thing would be a full firearm that requires a license. And I'd be in a lot of trouble because I can tell you that the barrel length on this is below 105 millimeters, which would make this a prohibited firearm. And it is a prohibited firearm. The only reason it's legal for me to have is because it falls into that 84 sub 3 exception where it's accepted from the provisions that would otherwise ban it. So this is legal to own in Canada. However, let's sort of consider what we can do with this. We've already determined that it's a firearm pursuant to section two of the criminal code, although it's an exempted firearm by 84 sub three. What that means, however, is that this will always be considered a weapon. No matter what you're doing with it, even if you're just going out to shoot targets, this is considered a weapon. So if you tuck this into your pocket where it's concealed, you would be committing a criminal offense of carrying a concealed weapon. They also advertise this as a self-defense implement. And if you're carrying this around for self-defense, it will usually, not always, but usually be considered an offense under section 88 sub 1, which is possession of weapon for purposes dangerous to the public peace. I think it's also worth considering just how effective this thing would be. So in order to do that, I actually did some testing with some ballistic gelatin with this thing. And ballistic gelatin is a decent enough substitute for flesh, although there's no bone in it, there's no skin on it. There's, it's not an ideal uh, substitute. But let's have a look at that uh, right now, and then we'll talk a little bit further about that. For handgun cartridges, typically standards are 12 to 18 inches of penetration into ballistic gel, and this manages less than three, so kind of a disappointing performance. That said, this might be enough to dissuade somebody based on either pain or the fear of what happens if they get shot, but I certainly wouldn't bank on it. This will have no possibility of stopping somebody based on disabling them or incapacitating them. It's not going to be like something like pepper spray. Pepper spray has a pain element to it, but it also tends to disable people from being able to continue in part because their eyes are watering, their nose is watering. It makes it hard for them to actually keep going. Pain compliance is typically very ineffective. I don't think this thing is even going to cause all that much pain unless you're happening to hit somewhere very vulnerable, but it could get you into a lot of trouble because as mentioned, this thing is a firearm for many legal purposes. So I don't think this thing is a great defensive weapon. Now we've already looked at sort of ballistic gelatin, but this is ballistic gelatin sort of replicating the scenario of being attacked by a naked guy. Let's see what happens when we put some cloth on it. And this is a pretty minimal level of cloth. I tried this a few more times, but what you see in the video is just confirmed. With the plastic end cap on, it fails to even penetrate, and without it, it penetrates less than an inch, just this initial spike bit. Now, as mentioned, this is very thin cloth. This is basically cheesecloth. A t-shirt would probably have denser material. I was going to try this as well with denim, but then I saw the performance at this point and I thought, why am I about to go and put a bunch of gelatin in a pair of my jeans and maybe put a hole in them? 
it's not worth it because this clearly has very little penetrative power. So in terms of a self-defense weapon, I would say do not use this. This is terrible. Uh, it is great for getting yourself in trouble, but it has no defensive purpose. It has no defensive value. Uh, the other thing I will note, and you see some of it in the videos, although uh, some bits ended up getting cut, uh, sometimes I had to struggle to get the button pushed, and that is not what you want in a defensive situation. You don't want to be sitting there going, eh, come on, fire. And the other thing is that sometimes the buttons come off. And so once the button comes off, that does two things. One, um, it means you're going to have a harder time firing it. You can still actually reach the little metal tab. So it might still be able to be fired, but you're going to have a hard time doing it. That said, Murphy's Law says that it might still be fired this way. And the concern I have is that the safety prevents the big plastic button from being pushed, but it doesn't prevent that little metal uh, end or little metal center bit from being pushed. So it's entirely possible that you could be carrying this around in your pocket and, you know, with your keys or something, one of the buttons comes off and that makes it very difficult if you need to use it, but I could see one of your keys happening to push this and stabbing you in the pocket. And you might say, oh, well, that's not such a big deal. I'm going to have the cover on it. But think about that in a defensive situation. You know, you're pulling this thing out and hopefully at that point, your assailant is disabled by laughter for a moment. So you've got some thinking time, but you pull the cap off and then you pull the slide back and then you aim it and then you fight with it to fire you're probably already having a bad day by that point. So I don't think this is, as I said, I think the only defensive use for this is throw it away and literally anything else. I mean, a rock is probably a better defensive implement than this. Uh, yeah, it's, I would rather have pocket sand than this thing in a, you know, in an actual defensive situation. That said, it's kind of a neat toy. I mean, I did enjoy shooting it at, you know, at a little cardboard target there. That was kind of fun. So I don't say, you know, that it's worthless. It makes for a fun toy if that's all you plan to do with it. And certainly I would not suggest doing anything else with it. In terms of sort of age ranges for this thing, uh, basically treat it the same way you'd treat a BB gun because it is a, you know, a firearm in the sense that it can put an eye out. And so I wouldn't trust young kids with this. It's certainly got enough of a spike that somebody could injure themselves fairly badly, notwithstanding the fact that it's not so useful as a defensive uh, implement. You know, you don't want anybody who's going to be, you know, at the age where they might sort of, ooh, what happens if I do this? That's not going to be a good scenario. Yeah, anyway, it's kind of a neat thing. I, I don't regret buying it. It's, you know, as I said, it's a fun little trinket. But I'm certainly not going to, you know, they've said, oh, this is a great self-defense weapon. Nah, not for that. Thank you for watching. Please like this video. Please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to see more content. And please don't buy one of these things for self-defense purposes. I guess I didn't really consider whether these could be used for hunting, but I think even on something as small as a squirrel, this would be cruel and ineffective. So don't buy it for that purpose either. This is a toy and nothing else. But it's kind of fun to go through and look at the legalities with this particular toy, especially given how it's being marketed. Now, I also want to thank my Patreon supporters. This is usually where I go through and sort of give the full run through. I can't actually access Patreon right now. It seems to be down, so I don't have the list of people. I've been waiting for a while for it to come back up, but I kind of just want to go ahead and put this video up. So my apologies. The proper crawl will be in the next one. So thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.